Thank you for joining us here at Creative Church. We pray today's word blesses your heart and blesses your life. And if it has, I want to encourage you to feed what's feeding you and to give to what is given to you. The easiest way to do that is to visit us at creativechurch.com slash give. Thank you for your faithfulness and for your generosity. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure to click on notifications so you never miss an encouraging word from Creative Church. Bless you today. I'm using a parallel in my title today of the message. You know, it says that Lord is holy and the angels cried, holy, holy, holy. The idea is superlative, holy, holy, or holiest. And when you hear it three times, that's as holy as you can get. Well, today the message is simply hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The threefold hallelujah. The text I'm reading from is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. And if you have a copy of the scripture or you can look up at the screen, I think they've got that up. The threefold hallelujahs come from Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And this message came to me this week as I was preparing to come to you. And I asked the Lord, what do you want me to share with them? And this came so clearly to me that we need to give the Lord thanks First of all, for what he's doing or what he has done in our past. And then we need to give the Lord thanks and say, holy, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah is the message for what he's doing in our present. And give him praise for what he shall do in our future. In Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, it says, do not remember the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? And in our future, I will even make a way or a road in the wilderness and rivers to run in your desert. Are you thankful today that the Lord is working all things together for your good? Because you love him and you're called for his purpose. It doesn't say all things are good, does it? It says all things what? Help me now. Work together for good to those who what? Love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If you love him today, just wave at me, you that are online. And if you know you're called for his purpose, I challenge you today with this word is to put these words in your mouth. Hallelujah for my past, hallelujah for my present, and hallelujah for my future. Because it's all a praise to God, amen. Hallelujah, Lord, that you have said that our past is in your hands. He made it so abundantly clear that if we will release our past to God, he will take whatever we commit to him. He keeps whatever we commit. How many of you know that he will take your bad past and work it even for your good? Simon Peter denied the Lord three times only to be encountered by Jesus after the resurrection. And Jesus only asked him three questions. It's very interesting. Jesus never shamed him. There was no shame on you. I told you so. Don't you love Jesus for that? He said, the woman at the well, when she said, I have no husband, he said, you said it well. He didn't say, you're a liar. He didn't say that, did he? He said, you have five husbands, and the one you're with now, you're not married to. No shame on you. You know, Jesus didn't shame the woman taken in the act of adultery. Aren't you thankful that he said, woman, where are your accusers? After he had said, he that without sin... You cast the first stone. What he was doing in those three instances that I just referenced, he was about to work together for good what the enemy meant for evil. Amen. Boy, let's give the Lord thanks for that. 
Because you couldn't be any more trouble than the three that I referenced. And particularly Simon Peter, all he asked Peter was, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And when, G- and when Peter answered affirmatively, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And the third time, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus then said what? You've got a bright future. Isn't that amazing? The Lord's that good. And he's that good to you today right where you are. And so if you've had a, some bad past, and how many of you can say, I know I've had some bad past. And you have things that pull you back into your past and the enemy comes to shame you, to pull you back into the past. I want you from this point on, when the enemy does that, I want you to learn to say hallelujah because Jesus has forgiven me. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, a chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. He broke Satan's legal power over you in the power of the cross and by his own blood. Let's praise him for a moment for that. And so I've heard it said before, when the enemy reminds you of your bad past, just tell him about his bad future. Amen. So I challenge you that if you're reminded about your bad past, begin to praise God right in the face of those uh, accusations that hit you. When the accuser of the brethren comes at you to accuse you of what happened yesterday, I'm here to tell you that you have already overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Somebody help me. By the word of what? Your testimony. And here's my testimony, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I've given my life even unto the death for Jesus, so I will say hallelujah in the face of my bad past whenever the enemy tries to bring it at me. But there's another thing that tries to pull you into your past, and that is sometimes the enemy tries to pull you back and say, remember the good old days. Remind you about your good past, what you lost, what was used to be, what was yesterday. Can I challenge you that that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was going through in the book of Philippians? Do you remember when he said in Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read it from the New King James Version, he said, But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Indeed, I also have counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. And he goes on and says, this one thing I do, I'm going down a little bit in the text, Forgetting those things which are behind, this is verse 13, and reaching forth toward those things which are before, he said, that's how you press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. And so the secret to beginning to experience God in the now is first of all to be able to release the bad and the good past. Here he does not say what things were lost to me. I counted lost. No, he said what things were gained to me, the good stuff of my past. And so many times you find yourself uh, thinking back of what could have been, should have been, or even ought to have been, when in reality, when those things were dropping away from you, the Lord was bringing you to where you are right now. And so I want to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have a little rhyme that I've used for many years, wrote it many, many years ago. I say when you're tempted to look back to live in the past, don't curse it, don't nurse it, don't rehearse it, disperse it, and God will reverse it. Did you hear that? Can I say it one more time? Don't curse it, 
Don't nurse it. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Why? Because you've got a great God who's in the process of working it all together to cause it to glorify Him at the highest level. Don't curse it. Don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. Because the more you talk about the good old days, which weren't all that good, or the bad old days, which are already gone because He's already forgotten it, forgiven it, forgotten it, and buried it in the sea of forgetfulness. Hallelujah. Don't curse it. Don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. But do what? Disperse it. Somebody say disperse it. That means you release it. You cast it on the Lord. And I'll guarantee you when you give it to him and it gets in his hands, how many of you know anything his hand touches is healed, is delivered, is freed. And so when the past creeps up on you, Remember these words from Isaiah, as I've read from Isaiah 43, 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider. That means don't dwell on them. It might float through your mind, but don't let it hang you up. Amen? Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. And so we praise him for the release of our past. But we say hallelujah, secondly, for the promise, and it's a great promise here on the first Sunday of the new year, behold, I will do a new thing. This word behold means get a hold of this. God is a God of new things. He was the creator of everything that is in the created order, but he was, he's also creating new things right now. How many believe, can believe that in the future he will do a new thing in your life? Right where you are, he is in the process of creating new things that will, he said, now it will spring forth. That word now is a pretty irreligious term in the sense that people have trouble with now. But now faith is, amen? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm not a God of yesterday's miracle or tomorrow's miracle. I'm the God of today's recreation, the God of doing a new thing in your life. We birthed the church many years ago. We had 14 people in a house. We went from the house to the skating rink. I don't know if you've caught on by now, but I'm from Texas. And I've never been in weather that has been 16 below except one time. And I forgot about that because I was told myself to say hallelujah, forget the former things. And so, uh, thank God, I know that I'm in Minnesota today. Praise God. And this is a great place to be. But we planted a church. We went from the home group of 14 to a high school that went to three or 400. From the high school, we went uh, out of the high school. We are, are actually went to a roller skating rink where we set up and tore up. Your church is so parallel to the church that I birthed years ago. From there, we went to the cafetorium where we tore down and put the thing back together every week. And then the Lord gave us our land. Uh, he gave us 50 acres of ground on the interstate. We built a building that had 197,000 square foot building. That's a big building. And it set a little over 10,000. And our town had 5,000 people in it. And we were packing that auditorium Sunday after Sunday. Can you say amen with me and praise the Lord? That happened for many, many years. While I was pastoring that church that we birthed, we were having a great time. There was such an outpouring of the Spirit. And all the way through, the Holy Spirit would say to me, this isn't about you. This isn't your deal. This isn't the... You did not build this church. How many know Jesus said, I will build my church? And we saw him do it. We watched him do it. And it was all built around the foundation of prayer. I'll be coming back in a, next week in a couple more weeks. 
and we'll be teaching and be sharing about some prayer promises and principles and a revelation that God gave me that Pastor mentioned a moment ago in his wonderful introduction before I came out. But then one day, the Lord said, I will do a new thing. And I said, Lord, what are you going to do? He said, if you will give me this one church, I will give you the nations of the world, and you will suffer, but you will get the nations. I'll give you the nations. And I said, Lord, if you give me the nations, I'll handle the suffering. And the result of that is 61 nations later, hallelujah, I finally got to Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. I got here to you for one reason, and that's to say that the Lord is in the process of doing a new thing in your now. We've released the past by saying what? Hallelujah. It's all working for my good. Now we say in the now, do your new thing, O Lord, in my life. It may not be as radical as what I just mentioned to you, and it may not be, it may not be all at one time, but it will evolve into something that will be different than what we've seen before. But at the same time, it will be somewhat of a recycling of what was going on when we birthed our church years ago. As a very young man, after I got saved, I witnessed to everybody. I just wanted to talk about Jesus. That's where we're headed this year. We're headed back to the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. This, this message that I'm bringing to you today is a message that really was birthed out of not just a prayer revelation, but it was birthed out of a, the reality that Jesus is real. Jesus is not a religious symbol or figure head of our religion. No, Jesus is really the real thing. Amen. And this morning I was reminded of the Apostle Paul when he preached the famous sermon in Acts chapter 17. Trust me, it's in the last uh, few verses there. He preached at a place called Mars Hill in a city called Athens. Everybody say Athens. He was in Athens, and Athens was a cultural city that was given over to philosophers who basically all they did day after day after day would sit around and talk about the latest philosophy of the day. During that time when Paul was there, the Bible says his spirit was stirred up inside of him. He wanted to go share something about Christ with them. So they allowed him because they knew he was a scholar. Many believe he spoke more than 30 languages. And we know he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest philosophers of the Jewish world at that time. And the Apostle Paul went to this place called Mars Hill, and he began to preach a message about the unknown God. And he began to share with them in a famous sermon that's been lauded and studied and replicated in so many different forms. And he talked to them about the unknown God. And finally we got to the end and said, and he raised him from the dead. And when he said that, the people began to disperse. They began to leave. A couple of people came to Christ. And he stood there and looked at that situation where he used every ounce of his education, all of his Ph.D. references. He pulled into one frame and he brought it to that group that did nothing but discuss philosophy and all kinds of different new thoughts. But the apostles, when they were sent forth, they were sent forth to preach Jesus. Amen. It's interesting in this sermon, he never mentions the name of Jesus one time. Nor did he leave in Athens a local church. One thing I know about this church is that it is under the covering of an apostolic grace. Are you thankful that you're under the covering of an apostolic grace? How do I know it? Look around. The evidence of God's work in and through Pastor Jonathan and his dear wife working among you, doing this great work. 
preaching the simplicity of the gospel and bringing you to the place where Jesus is the main event. Amen. And so today, in Jesus' name, the Apostle Paul looked at that situation knowing full well on this second missionary journey that he was sent to preach Christ, sent to speak of the name of Jesus, but he hadn't done it. Sent to birth local churches, but there was no local church in Athens. And then beginning reading in Acts chapter 18, verse 1, he said, From Athens he went to Corinth. Now Corinth was the city to which he later wrote books back to the church of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you remember. And there he starts off in 1st Corinthians chapter 2, And if you want to follow along with that, this is an incredible something that went on inside of him as he was traveling from Athens to Corinth. Something revolutionary happened in him because he'd made an inner decision. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellence of speech, or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing (laughs) among you or anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He made a shift. He said, I was with you in weakness, physical weakness, fear, and much trembling. He Himself in His own physical frame was nothing to be boastful about. But He goes on to say, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive or enticing words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. You see, the determination to know nothing but Jesus and Him crucified brought the demonstration of the Spirit. For you see, we don't save anybody. We preach the gospel, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. What is the power of God? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we were preaching years ago, and the first person I ever led to Jesus was a guy that everybody knew in town because he was a rock and roll artist and a very well-known group back then. They were called Mouse and the traps, and he was one of the traps. And Jerry had long blonde hair down to here, and I had real short hair up to here. I played golf, and he played a B3 organ. And he was the one that rode around town in his Volkswagen van, and he kept the shades pulled, and all the mamas and daddies say to their daughters, stay away from that one right there. He was... He was Uh, a real hippie if some of y'all reference that and know what that was he was living wild but he'd come to the place in his life after his father had died he'd come home he was attending the Baptist church in our town and I was allowed to preach there as a very young man and he came up to me and he said Larry I've been listening to this PhD religion man for days I'm getting nothing from it But when I heard you get up there, you just wanted to talk about Jesus. Now, this was a good 40-something years ago, and every 40 years, it seems things recycle. I can tell you in the coming year, the church you're in and the church that the world is going to see is a church that focuses and totally puts their penetrated determination on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to be ashamed to say the name of Jesus. And Jerry looked at me and he said, man, can you tell me, is this thing about Jesus real? And I said, well, man, I'll pick you up on Friday night. We'll go out to the little church where I'm a youth pastor. They got a B3 organ there. And you can play Amazing Grace on the organ. They'd never heard Amazing Grace like that before, ladies and gentlemen. And that guy, he was all over that thing. And at midnight, he said, okay, man, I was sitting in his driveway. Tell me about Jesus. And so I began to preach Christ to him. 
I began to tell him he had to make a great exchange, be willing to give his life to Jesus, lose his life to find it in Christ. About three hours later, I'd finished. He said, stop, man, stop. Now I see people checking their watches. I promise I'm not going to preach three hours. But he said, stop, I, I believe I've got it. I believe, but tell me, how do you get it? I said, well, and honestly, all I knew about the Bible then was Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I said, man, you go in and you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You get down on your knees and you lift your hands up and you begin to holler, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And once you, once you say Jesus about the third time, it'll hit you. And when it hits you, you know you got it. Well, I got home an hour and a half later. He called me on the phone and he said, Larry, I got it, man. I got it. He said, I just went down to Max's house, our drummer, and he was in his backyard feeding his rabbits, different kind of people at that time. And he, he said, Max was back there, and I started telling him about how to get it. So he took his Bible, and he read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He started hollering, Jesus, I think Max has got it too. He said, but you better come check Max out because you know how weird he is. Well, Jerry turned out to be Dr. Jerry and pastored a great church for 40 years, hallelujah, in Dallas, Texas. I want to give God all the glory because when you focus on Jesus, you may not know very much about it. the depth and the length and the breadth and the height of all the theological stuff that you can learn along the way. But when you find out that Jesus is your all in all, Christ is in you, hallelujah. And in Christ, you are complete. Colossians 2 and verse 10 says, you are complete in him. You're not complete in your flesh. You're not complete in no matter how much you know. Ultimately, ultimately in your spirit, in your soul, and in your body, he is your all in all. And once that begins to be the focus of your life, you begin to balance out, level out, and you can say, praise God in the now, he can do what he wants to do. Because when he spoke to me and said, release this church and I will give you the nations of the world, that was not something I could do quickly. How many of you understand? We had a wonderful congregation and a wonderful church as you do here a facility that was incredible. But the Lord said, you give that to me, and I'll give this to you. Most of life involves great exchanges. You exchange this, I'll give you that. And so I challenge you today that as you begin to look into what the Lord has for you concerning the new thing that the Lord's going to do in your life, remember this word from Isaiah 43. It says, behold, I will do a new thing. And then this word now is a very interesting word. Now it shall spring forth. And then the question comes, shall you not know it? Can I challenge you to begin by faith that when you wonder what's going on in your life, instead of trying to figure it out in your mind, how many ever tried to figure it out in your mind? What's happening now? Can I just say, go ahead and praise God in faith? Because that's the word of the Lord that the, he gave me for this congregation right now, that Jesus is becoming your all in all. Amen. And as you lift your voice and say, thank you, Jesus, you're doing this work as you give him praise, then there'll come revelation and you'll be challenged. Amen. Not to miss it. May I also say at that point to encourage you to rise in the morning and before you get busy running into your day, to spend time with the Lord. Amen. This is a great challenge at the beginning of the year, not a New Year's resolution. But when you know it's prayer time in the morning, don't say later, Lord, because later may be too late for what God wants to do in your now. I really felt impressed to share this with you that this morning, I woke up at 4.24. My wife and I flew in yesterday afternoon. We got in the room so graciously prepared for us. 
And we got in the room and we began to uh, relax a little bit, finally went to sleep sometime around midnight. And at 424, I remember John 424, where it says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. How many are thankful that, that we can seek God? Amen. But I'm more thankful when he seeks me. The Father seeketh such to worship him. And that penetrated me as I rolled over and looked at the clock. And I knew it was prayer time. I got up and went over and prayed. I don't think I was there more than an hour or so. But as I was praying, this word continued to come. Hallelujah. Give him praise for now. For the new thing that's being birthed in you. The new thing that's being birthed in all of you. And you that are online listening to me right now. It's going to be birthed by faith. Can I say that again? And praise is the language of faith. As I'll be teaching a lot on prayer in the next few weeks here to your leadership and to many of you. I want to remind you that when he taught us to pray, he said, we begin our prayer with hallowed be thy name. Amen. He ends the prayer with thine is what? The kingdom. Say it with me. And the power and the glory. It starts with praise and it ends with praise. What is he saying to us? The last five chapters of the book of Psalms starts like this. Hallelujah. It gives you the psalm, ends, hallelujah. Gives the psalm, hallelujah. All of those last five chapters begin with hallelujah. What is he saying? He's saying to us, we must keep our praise focused on him who alone is worthy. Because we cannot figure this thing out in our natural mind. But I'm telling you that he's got it all worked out. And he's doing it all to explode new things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. New things in our life as we go along. And so as I challenge you this way, I'm telling you that there is a new thing that is being released in and through your life. We are seeing that he not only gives us a hallelujah concerning our yesterdays and a hallelujah concerning now, our present, but he also gives us a hallelujah concerning the future. I've noticed as from time to time I will turn on the news, they have no good news about the future. Have you noticed that? They only have bad news about something that happened yesterday or is happening now. Accusations abounding. But the good news about the future is I will make a way in your wilderness. And I will cause rivers to run in your desert. I've lived much of my life in a, a desert. I've lived out in the desert, cold at night, hot during the day, all kinds of little bugs and stuff running around the rest of the time. And you find out that as you live in the desert, sometimes you see mirages. And you look and you see, and it's nothing but sand over there, but it looks like water. I'm going to tell you today that the way that he's going to make in your wilderness and the road that will run through your desert will not be a dead end. Praise God. Somebody give him praise. Because he's working it by his spirit. And I go back to that one scripture. Determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The pure simplicity of the gospel is where we're returning. And we will see then the Lord do things that we could never do for ourselves. How many of you have had a miracle in your life? And you know the Lord did it. And you know that the Lord did it. It's a way so you give a testimony to somebody around you that may need a miracle today. I was reading in the book of Psalms this week about this word that... Uh, talks about making a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I challenge you and I charge you and I even beseech you today. Don't be afraid when the Lord says this is the new thing. Step into it. Because Jesus' new thing will always bring forth great fruit for the kingdom. It will always glorify Him. You can always parallel it to a verse in the scripture. 
It'll never contradict any of those things. But he gave a word in Psalm 56. I wanted to read it to you because it has meant so much to me. He said, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word or praise his promise. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh or what man or what the world can do to me. This is an incredible promise, an incredible uh, adjournment where the Lord says through the psalmist, I will not be afraid. And the most often given commandment in all the Bible is what? Fear not. Did you know that? 365 different times in one form or the other, the Lord commands us to fear not. That's not talking about an emotional fear or a panic attack. The word fear here means to be stepping back when you should be what? Stepping in, stepping forward. And so he says, fear not, but then he gives the most often given promise that's connected to the most often given commandment. Fear not for what? I am with you. Peter was the only one that said, Lord, if it's... If it's really you out there on the water, when Jesus went walking on the water, if it's really you, bid me come to you on the water. Jesus did not give him a lecture on water walking. He didn't give him a manual to study. No, Jesus said one word, come. And before Peter knew what he had done, he stepped out on a word. Sometimes it's going to be one word. One word. I'm thinking about uh, Pastor Darnell who got one word from God, feed the children. He put it on Facebook and before he knew what he was doing, the church there in St. Louis has been feeding thousands and thousands of children a week. It happened because of one word. How many would rather have one word from God than 10,000 words from man? And it'll come on the inside of you. And you'll know, as I like to say it, you'll know in your knower, that's God. That's the Spirit speaking to me. I want to encourage you because it's a new thing. The first thing we're tempted to do is step back and take a look at it, to analyze it, to figure it out. But I want to encourage you when you hear, fear not. Remember, he said, I will. When Pastor Jonathan called me and said, Dr. Lee, would you come and just be with us? on this first Sunday of the new year and then come back and begin to teach on prayer and impart to our people that revelation that God put in you about prayer that caused the great churches around the world that have been built. Would you come? I said, I will. That's all I needed to say. I will. And he trusted my word. And if I, a man with flesh from my feet to the top of my head, can be trusted with an I will, can I tell you, you can praise him for your future. Because he said, I will make a way. You've been, you've been so challenged here of late, as we all have been. I will share with you today that a year ago, at this time, my wife and I both had covid Later, it got, got into my lungs with all kind of blood clots. Thank God I never had to be hospitalized. Amen. Amen. But, the, but I continue to say, hallelujah, Lord. Right into it. Now, I'm, I, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm, I'm not going to give you COVID. Amen. <laughs> because I'm double vaxxed and boosted. Amen. Amen. Be that as it may, no matter how you feel about that, please don't judge me, all right? Because I'm here, hallelujah. And I praise God I'm here. But I will share with you that two years ago I was in a terrible accident. And my mouth was impacted and my teeth were knocked out of my head. On December the 8th, I'm talking about about three weeks ago, a little bit more than that now. I had a major surgery in my mouth they literally built me a new mouth today is the first day that I've preached with these (laughs) 
I have not spoken one time since that major surgery. But I told your pastor, I will. I will. And now, 52 years later, frankly, I'm still saying I will, but not by might, not by power, not by my flesh, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Why? Because I continually said to the Lord, I release my past to you, O Lord. Not going to curse it, not going to nurse it, not going to rehearse it. I'm going to disperse it and give you praise to reverse it. Somebody say hallelujah. I'm going to believe that now the new thing will be the recycling of an old thing, which is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody praise him with me and say hallelujah. 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 And then the threefold hallelujah. Thank God you've got a future. The past is gone and the present is here upon us. But there's a future in this new year. And in this new year, what will we do to exemplify, to magnify, and to proclaim the name that is above every name? What will we do to cause somebody as weird as weird Jerry to get saved and become someone who changed his world. Can I say to you that in this morning, as I joyfully stand before you, I leave with you a threefold admonition, a threefold encouragement. Please begin to say it when you get up in the morning. Hallelujah. 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 Give him a hallelujah for your past and watch the devil shut his mouth. Give him an hallelujah for your present and begin to praise him that he is in the process of manifesting Christ through you in that that day. This day is the only day we have that we can give God praise. But as our days evolve and we go forward, We begin to give him praise because he said, I will make a way. And you that are at home, you may have nothing left but a little whisper. But go ahead and say it. Hallelujah. You here in the congregation, you feel the anointing just sweep. And it wasn't the music. As much as I appreciate you, brother. I love you. Thank you. The anointing just went whoosh. I've learned in these years of preaching just to wait as I'm preaching the word to the Spirit just comes. How many sense His presence? Just lift up a hand. Yep. Father, thank you. Thank you for that unmistakable manifestation of pure revelation, not of a man preaching. But, oh, Lord, of Jesus himself, you might want to lift another hand. For we lift holy hands, one without wrath, because you've removed it through the blood of the cross. Another hand lifted without doubt, because we believe, as we begin this year, that if we will give you an hallelujah, a hallelujah, a threefold hallelujah, One for the past, one for the present, and one for the future. You surely will do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. I want everybody in this place that says, I want a fresh revelation of Jesus. Wave your hands. Wave your hands to the Lord and call out and say with me, Lord Jesus. Out loud and right where you are at home watching. Say it again. Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. I receive you in the now. I give you a threefold hallelujah. And I lock this into my spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Now, let's just lift our voice and say thank you, Lord. Begin to praise Him right where you are. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. And we say you are great. And you are greatly to be praised. Father, I pray for Pastor Jonathan, his precious wife and beautiful family. And all the team and all the team leaders. I ask you, Father, to keep your hand on them as they see things that they never thought they would see before. And Lord, as you manifest your glory in this wonderful new facility, let it all redound to the hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let it never be forgotten and let it never stop. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to say and to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Everybody lift your voice and say, praise the Lord. Let's just go ahead and praise Him a little bit right now. Give Him praise. You want to clap your hands? Somebody shout, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. I'll see you later.